This, obviously, this is the day for people who have done something for 35 years. I've been doing energy for 35 years. Obviously, I started when I was four. Um, but here I am, and it's an interesting time to be in this business. Actually, it's always been, but then I'm kind of an infrastructure geek, so I always find these things interesting. But <clears throat> I also find it interesting that some of the ideas that I will go over with you very quickly have already been put up here by Nancy yesterday. It made me feel much better to see her articulate wonderfully some of those ideas because it made me feel that possibly I wasn't as crazy as I feared. Um, so that's a good thing. I like to call this renewable energy the invisible revolution and I will tell you why because if I'm going to use this title I probably have to explain it. Ha! Huh. The thing on the left is called a telephone. They were black. They were connected by a monopoly. You couldn't have call waiting. You, some of you may remember these. It's no longer anywhere near the same in the last 40 years, starting with, with uh, Judge Harold Green in 1982. This whole thing changed in a revolutionary fashion. That's the La Paloma Theater on the left. It was built in 1928. It's in Encinitas, California. It showed movies, and you had to actually go to the theater and sit in seats possibly as uncomfortable as these <laughs> um, to, hear, to watch the movie. It's kind of different now with Netflix being in 130 countries. Kind of a change in how not only the ownership, to some extent the production, certainly the distribution, and the way of consuming the good or service have changed dramatically. Even more complicated, the round black thing is called a record. Um, I don't know what it's sitting on anymore. I used to have one, but I've forgotten. Um, and now it's all on your cell phone. Okay, here's a, here's a test. Which of these two pictures was taken in 1975 and which was taken from our roof deck one week ago? <laughs> they look kind of the same, don't they? And they are kind of the same. There has been no change in the distribution system of the electric utility industry since way before 1975, honestly. We're still using wood poles, cross pieces, copper wire, and the, let's see if this works. Those little ceramic insulators, which we've used for possibly 100 years. Not those exact ones, but something very much like them. Um, that's all changing, and it's changing in ways you can't see because what the average customer sees is this. And your bill, which looks higher, that's a change, not so good. And you see your electric meter, which looks almost identical to what it looked like 40 years ago. But past that, things are dramatically changing and here's the punchline they are changing for the better and they're changing in ways that will end up with an electric system with substantially less environmental and climatic input and it will be cheaper i hate giving away the punchline but it's sort of hard to find a solution to a large social problem which ends up with a technology which gives you a better solution for a cheaper price trust me i'll explain this Here's the kind of baseline. This is the EIA 2015 Outlook reference case, their business as usual case. They say renewables go from 13% to 18%. Natural gas goes up, coal doesn't do so well, nuclear kind of stays where it is, and oil is nothing in electricity. Um, I'm absolutely 100% convinced, and I would bet a substantial amount of money on it, that that number, the nuclear number is wrong, too high. Coal number is wrong, too high. Renewable number is wrong, too low. Natural gas is probably too high. Let me just tell you quickly, as quickly as I can. This will be like the guys that do Shakespeare in 24 minutes. I'm going to tell you why this is. Coal. There are some good things about coal. It's gotten kind of a bad rap because it deserves it. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's cheap. We can build reliable power plants, although they're very complicated. If you're a geek, they're really kind of cool because there are all sorts of different machines in them and things that grind and steam and things that make noise. It's kind of a guy sort of technology, really. 
Um, the conversion of the coal fuel is about 42%, which 32 to 40. It's very plentiful domestically. No one can hold this up on an embargo. The plants are costly. They use a lot of water. 5% of all the water used in California, hello, um, is in power plants. It's the largest single industrial use. <laughs> of water in California. <laughs> Oh, there's more. <laughs> they have, good old coal plants have, of course, significant traditional air emissions. Coal mining is the second most dangerous occupation in the country. Please do not go out and try and do it on your own. Um, and they're awful on CO2 because coal is pretty much all carbon. And we don't have any, any way, and to be honest, any hope of having any way of taking the CO2 out of the emission stream and then sticking it somewhere. Because we can't take it out of the emission stream at any reasonable price, the CO2, and there is no idea where we would put it, possibly with all the nuclear waste. That would be nice. Then we'd have all the bad stuff in one place. Anyway, it's kind of a problem. This is one of my new slides. I just worked on this. <laughs> the little... There is no future in coal, okay? Not any. Since 2010, 33 U.S. coal companies have gone bankrupt, including the single largest publicly traded coal company called Peabody. Remember the folk song, Mr. Peabody's coal trains have hauled it away? Well, they got hauled away into bankruptcy. And now the single largest privately held coal company called Murray is about to file for bankruptcy. It's just... There's not any future for it. That's, that's the simple fact. By the way, if in the last day or two you have not sated your need for badly readable small type slides, I have the list of all 33 coal companies I'll be happy to show you. Um, oil. That's the, let me make sure I say this right. That's the first oil well drilled in the world. The Drake well, 19, 1850 in Titusville, Pennsylvania, near a feature called Oil Creek. Well, I guess I would argue if you're going to drill an oil well, drilling it near Oil Creek is maybe a smart idea. Um, they hit oil. That's Santa Barbara, where that's a surfer who's not drilling for oil. Um, in many senses, oil is a terrific fuel. It is highly packed with BTUs. It is relatively widely distributed around the world. It's increasingly easy to find. It's pretty easy to transport, and it can be done in, an, in a number of uses, mostly transportation, because you need something you can put in a vehicle that's full of energy, or else you'd have to, as we used to, pull an entire carload of coal behind you to feed your automobile, which would be cumbersome. Um, it's cheap. The U.S. is an exporter. By some numbers, the U.S. now has more reserves of oil than anybody in the world, including Saudi Arabia and Russia. Well, that's good. Um, but, you know, and there's no free lunch. We've gone to war twice, at least once in Iraq, twice in Iraq, mostly about oil because we were importing it. That's Deepwater Horizon. Here's some interesting numbers. Um, Deepwater Horizon, the, the BP oil rig. BP stock, before this happened, was 100, its net worth as a company was $105 billion. After this, $60 billion. Mm. That's kind of a bad hit for the stockholders. $32 billion worth of charges, $18 billion worth of fines, a 40% decline in gasoline sales. The company has really never recovered. That's risky even for a company like an oil giant. Oh, and by the way, transportation is not without risk. That's one of those numerous oil trains that because we aren't gonna build an oil pipeline from Canada, that seem to about every third day fall off the tracks and explode somewhere, usually in really pleasant small towns. So stay out of small towns also, because they're very dangerous. Um, decarbonization, when you really boil it all down, is really about three things. Transportation's about a third, electricity, which I'm gonna talk about extensively, is about 40%, and the rest, home heating and everything else. Transportation, however, is 91% petroleum. 
That's really where the oil goes. About 75% of all oil goes into transportation. We are not going to solve putting less carbon into the atmosphere unless we solve transportation. Fortunately, there are solutions. Um, the guy on the left's not a solution. He's more a harbinger. Um, being on the right is a solution. And there are now several more electric cars being manufactured, some more in California. The Chinese are starting to make electric cars. And the thing that's making this all work is the batteries are getting less expensive and more powerful and longer lasting. I don't mean to say that I think technology will save us all from this and that we don't have to have appropriate policies and, honestly, appropriate behavior. But I'm not throwing away the good technology because it's useful. Gas, natural gas is kind of an enigma. Um, it was under $2 a million BTU. It's been as high as $18 a million BTU. Try and plan, if you are doing investments, try and plan for burning natural gas. And input into your models, was it going to be two bucks? Is it going to be 18? I mean, what's the deal? It is widely available. Emissions are much less troublesome than coal or oil, but not untroublesome. Um, it's well, the technology is well known. It's efficient. We can permit it. We can manage it. Very good backup capability. Quick start, quick stop. You need that if you're going to insert a substantial amount of renewables into the electric system. But again, <clears throat> Aliso Canyon, largest single release of natural gas, inadvertent release of natural gas from a set of storage wells in California, where everything good and bad happens frequently simultaneously. Um, <laughs> It would, and the reason, this is, this is speculation, the reason, you know, after that happened, then you, nobody really sort of heard about it, is the damn stuff is, is invisible. There's natural gas, that's the only reason you see that is this is an infrared photograph. You couldn't stand there right next to this gigantic plume of natural gas going up in the air and see anything. Otherwise, you would have seen day after day after day after day pictures of all this stuff being released. That release amounted to about 25% of the average carbon emissions for the United States for a whole year. Yeah, that's pretty, and it was methane, which is, pick your number, 21%, 21 times worse than CO2. I heard yesterday it's 71 times worse, which is really troublesome. It's troublesome the numbers could run around like that. Plus, natural gas has price challenges. I told you it had been under $2, right? Um, well, I looked it up. Sometimes you actually have to use data. On March 17th, natural gas was $1.64 of this year. On July 11th, which was today, it was $2.82. This is all Henry Hub trading point data. That's a 72% price increase in four months. You cannot build natural gas using facilities and absorb those kinds of price swings and have a hope of ever making any money. It's a troublesome fuel, if for no other reason, then the price swings are terrible. I probably don't have to say anything about this. Um, <laughs> San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, whose, whose anagram is songs, which is not the right way to think of this. The way to think of this is a power plant built to last 50 years that is only lasting 30 is going to be taken out of service. It is one of only two power plants ever built in California. The second one, Diablo Canyon, is slightly north of this. It has just been decided by PG&E correctly that they're going to take Diablo Canyon out of service in about six years, not relicense it, not reload the fuel, not do anything they have to do. And why is that? Because they're worried it's terribly dangerous? Well, come on, these are utility guys. They don't, they don't feel pain or heat. Um, <laughs> no, because it isn't cost effective. Natural gas is relatively low, and their price of renewables continue to plummet, making it uneconomic to run your nuclear plant. We are close to the point, and in some cases have passed it, where a new solar plant charging not only its operating costs, but its capital costs, full capital costs, at a reasonable financial structure with reasonable equity returns for the investors, is cheaper than just the operating cost, fuel, labor, insurance, no capital of these plants. Fort Calhoun in Nebraska is being retired. It's the only nuclear plant in Nebraska. Exelon has announced it is retiring Clinton and Quad Cities, both in the Chicago area, after losing 
<clears throat> over the last five years, $800 million. Aha, they do feel something. I believe it's money. <laughs> the South Carolina nuclear plant VS Summer is two years overdue in terms of construction and likely to be three years more late. It started at the modest price of $10.3 billion and is now up to $14.3 billion. When it comes online with any reasonable capital recovery and using normal operating costs, it'll make 11, 12 cent power. Keep that number in mind. You'll see why that's important in just a minute. Okay, business as usual scenario says we get 812 billion kilowatt hours by 2040 distributed like this. A lot of hydro, by the way, no, almost none of that's new. It's what we have now. We're not building a lot of new dams in this country and hopefully not in a lot of other places, although some. Others, geothermal and so forth, little tiny piece of solar, that's wrong, um, and a nice piece of wind, which is probably about right. But that was a business as usual, as usual case, the one I showed you at the beginning. It doesn't have the clean power plan in it. The Obama administration clean power plan proposed, although it's been set aside for the moment, to shut down a bunch of coal-fired power plants simply. And when you did that, who wins and who loses? Well, that shouldn't be hard. Oops. The guys who make coal lose about 800 billion kilowatt hours. The guys who make, yes, I'll say it, renewables gain. That's 800 billion more kilowatt hours on top of the 800 billion already. The power project, in essence, doubles the amount of renewables going into the system. And frankly, I think even that's too low. And it won't take the Obama Power Plan, it'll take plain and simple economics. Why do I think that? Last, last year, 2015, two thirds of new electric generating capacity installed in this country was solar or wind. Let's say that again. Two thirds of new capacity it wasn't gas, wasn't, certainly wasn't coal, wasn't nuclear, it was solar, it was solar and wind. That's a that's a pretty remarkable place to be. We're not the first people, by the way, to ever notice that the sun shines and, you know, you can make electricity out of it. Even Thomas Edison saw that. What a source of power. Um, unfortunately, he didn't then do anything about it, but he was busy inviting the light bulb and the electric toothbrush. Um, solar. Okay. For years and years and years, those of us in the power industry said to our nagging wives, we're not doing solar yet because it's not very cost effective. And our nagging wife said, you'll be sorry. You'll be sorry. You should listen to me. Um, but it was, <laughs> I made that up. It was the little train, it was the little engine that could, except it couldn't because it cost too much. However, we're past that. As a technology, and I'm talking about photovoltaic solar, mostly polycrystalline silicon. There are also some thin film versions deployed in large amounts on land that because I'm in a room of land use people and I feel very threatened. <laughs> that, see that land? Crummy, awful, nasty, salty, unpleasant. Nothing grows there, nothing lives there. And if it does live there, it can walk around underneath them because it's not squashed. Um, and it's almost all private sector land. Mostly we take land out of stupid agricultural production, making alfalfa with irrigated water in the desert to ship to racehorses in Japan, which seems kind of curious. I'm not making that part up, I wish. Um, anyway, it's not, it isn't a problem in terms of land use. It's reliable. Remember I told you coal plants were probably 80 to 85% reliable. Nuclear is actually less reliable. Nuclear is one of the most intermittent sources of power that we have, but we can't program the intermittency. Uh, this stuff runs all the time. If we got to the point where we were only getting 98% availability on these plants, we sent somebody out to see what was wrong. They ran at 99 to 99.5% availability. They just sit there. The sun comes in, hits an electron, electricity squirts out. There you go. None of all that other fancy stuff. Conversion efficiency is not great. It's intermittent. It's intermittent. Did I say that twice? There are actually two kinds of intermittency. It took me a long time to figure this out. Um, this is the second kind. The first kind, which I perhaps don't have to explain, is the sun does not shine at night, although we have engineers working on that. Um, 
This happens when a cloud goes across the sun. I don't know why. I have asked why like about 100 times. The answer is, we don't know. Well, so I can still see when a cloud goes across the sun. Why don't the stupid panels work? We don't know, but they do not. And they don't work dramatically, rapidly. There's almost a 90% fall off within one minute of the output of a solar panel if a cloud goes across the sun. Huh, so that's not terrific if you're managing an electric grid and somebody's supply, your supply is going on and off and on and off and on and off. It makes you very cranky. Um, fortunately, there are ways to fix that. Another good thing about solar, you can do it in small increments. You do not have to build 2,000 megawatt power plants, unlike most other traditional fossil and nuclear alternatives. And there is a movement afoot to let people organize in company, in cities, five states in the union now do this, including California, which I think was one of the first. And you can simply set up your city as kind of a quasi-utility and go out and buy your own renewable energy. The utility will still deliver it for you and do the billing, so that's still fine and you have to pay for that. But you can set up what's called in California community choice aggregation. If that doesn't swim trippingly off the tongue, then I am not a poet. <laughs> Terrible name, horrible name, community choice aggregation. Um, most people just call it community solar. It's efficient at small sizes. This, this will really accelerate the ability to put big solar plants not on rooftops, which isn't in the long run. I'm sorry to say this terribly efficient. It's okay, but it's not very efficient. Build them someplace where there's crummy land, buy it as a community, and have solar, have 100% renewables if you want to. The three jurisdictions that have done it in California are Marin County, Sonoma County, and a small city called Livingston. At least Marin and Sonoma have now got electric rates lower than those from PG and E. Let's say that again. Lower than PG and E with 10 million analysts and 5,000 managers. Here's, you know, six guys in Sonoma who probably aren't drunk all the time. Um, <laughs> Buying electricity cheaper than the geniuses at Pacific Gas and Electric, who also tried to blow their customer up with their, with their gas network, but that's a different problem. Um, so, shoot, that's, that's good. Impressive growth. We did 16 gigawatts of solar in 2016. 16 gigawatts is roughly 16 nuclear power plants, individual units. We did them in a year. You can't build a nuclear plant in less than 10 years, and you're crazy to try. Why this, this is a GTM forecast, why this number goes back down is analytical stupidity, because why would it go up now and then back down? It won't. It'll continue to increase at a very fast rate. Um, batteries. Might be the natural gas killer. I started the battery program at AES, and then it was picked up by a very capable guy named Chris Shelton who now runs the largest utility scale battery program in the world. And AES doesn't like to say things like that very often because then it's you're cursed and people try and get you, um, but it is. They've deployed, I think, 20 some different units now, more than 200 megawatts, some of it in the US, some in Chile. <clears throat> Batteries, they're kind of cool. They are not perfectly cheap yet, but they are getting cheaper as I'll show you in a second. They're reliable. Turn them on, the electricity comes out once again every electrical engineer's dream. No emissions, no siting. See this being picked up? We put it down one place, we didn't like where it was, we took it and moved it to a different plant. Nobody cared, looked like a container. It was a container. Solves intermittency. Its batteries are very good at turning on and generating power rapidly, and then if you turn them off, they go, okay. And if you compare that with the slide I showed you before of the solar, of the solar output in a cloudy day, match a battery up with that and you have a beautiful, perfect curve during the day. Behind the scenes, the battery's going, okay, me now? Okay, no, I'll turn off. Okay, now? But the, jet, the guy running the power system sees that. And he's much happier, as he should be, because running a power system's not so easy. Lithium-ion battery learning curves. Look at that. Wow, look at those prices come down. 20, 2005, 2015. Here's an even better quote. A guy who runs a, a company called STEM, which is a battery company which has deployed not as many as AES, but has deployed 64 megawatts of batteries, mostly in California, said two days ago, 
that in the last 18 months, he's seen a 70% decrease in the cost of the lithium ion batteries that he buys. 70%? Man, I am glad I am not in the lithium business. Whoa. Um, but that's, if you keep that up, oh, and Sonnen, who makes a battery you can put in your house. So if you really get mad at your utility company, then you can just pull the plug, make solar during the day, put it in the battery, run your house at night, and you're fine. They cut their price by 40% for their commercial battery. That was just last week. And those are not, those are Germans. They didn't do anything that they haven't thought about for 100 years. <laughs> um, it's, it's pretty dramatic. This is the 32 megawatt Laurel Mountain installation. Just to show you that I'm not kidding, they really do put these things in places. This offsets a 32 megawatt wind plant in West Virginia. Okay, here's the conclusion to be followed by, of course, more slides because I can never stop. Um, here's what's gonna happen. The, revol the revolution will become visible. Coal goes away quickly. And it goes away because it cannot compete economically. Soon it will not be able to compete just on operating cost. Just on operating cost. Nukes go away slowly because where are we gonna put all the spent fuel? But <clears throat> they're gonna leave huge costs behind. I can't solve that right now, probably next week. Um, Oil goes away, but very slowly, because it's a really terrific fuel. And replacing all the transportation vehicles is gonna take a while, but it will come. Solar batteries win cheaper and cheaper. It's astonishing. When I first started doing this, oh, we were paying four, about $4,500 a kilowatt. The most recent installations are probably $300 a kilowatt in seven years. <clears throat> Utilities survive which is great because th then I can still have somebody to make fun of. Um, but there are networks. They're, if this were a broadcasting network, they are no longer content providers. They don't make electricity. They just arrange for it to be distributed, metered, built, collected, and so forth. Probably they remain as monopolies because they are now. Breaking them up is sort of troublesome. And honestly, they don't do a terribly efficient job, but if they're just delivering the stuff and sending you the bill, you know, the bulk of what you're paying is the, is the commodity cost, and if your local city is doing that, the rest of it is not so troublesome. Electricity everywhere. This is almost my favorite slide. These are forecasts from EIA, the Energy Information Administration of the U.S. government, 2000, 2006, 2010. These are International Energy Agency, which is an even more high-powered, more bureaucratic organization in Brussels, and no longer, I guess, in London, um, <laughs> two, two forecasts there. All five of those forecasts are in that area. Then there is something called real life. What actually happened? Oh, shit, look at that. Well, that wasn't such a good forecast, now was it? <laughs> um, that's, I like data. Because, you know, if you really have data, you kind of got at least half a leg up in any argument. This is data. I'm, if there were something cheaper and better than solar energy, I would tell you what it was and I would be for it. But there isn't anything. And this stuff has proven to be remarkable and is going ahead astonishingly rapidly. Here's my, fav my second favorite slide. Prices. I've said it's cheap. Well, okay, what's that mean? How cheap is it? Solar stuns in Mexico's first clean energy auction, 5.2 cents. Then, down here, about a month later, that was in March. Nobody had ever hit 5.2 cents. That's without a 30% ITC, by the way. Nobody ever hit 5.2 cents. Then, good old Palo Alto negotiated with a, with a developer, as I used to be, and, and it came in at 3.2 three and a half cents. These are megawatt hour prices, not cents, but that's 3.544 cents, okay? Remember when I told you what nuclear plants cost? 10, 11, 12? That's fully loaded. That's with capital and operating cost. And then, of all places in the world, Dubai had an auction to build solar plants. That was in May, 2.99 cents, less than three cents. You can't be, you can't beat that with, a, with most, most operating plants if charging operating cost only, fuel, people, insurance. 
higher than that. So, you can see why I think it's such good news that I recommend that we bring back, oh, one more, the three, the three caballeros. Um, these are Trudeau, Peña Nieto, and of course the president meeting June 27th and announcing that they were gonna take their respective countries taken together to a 50% renewable standard by 2025. Three or four years ago, nobody in this right mind would have said that those three countries, or even any one of them, could get to 50% renewables by 2025. But they can. In fact, all three of them can. And it is likely, given the way the economics work, that they will. When in doubt, if you're choosing between betting on economics and betting on law and policy, always bet on economics. And thus, my recommendation is that we bring back, as the national US motto, ready kilowatt. Thank you. <laughs>